Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Bashar Jenkins Jr. and I am a fellow in the Office of Health Equity in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention here at the CDC. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day webinar. We have some housekeeping items to address before we begin this afternoon. All participant lines are muted. We will have time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers from our virtual audience. Please submit your questions in the chat box on the screen and my colleague Lamont Skills White and myself will be monitoring the chat throughout and will facilitate the Q&A portion of our webinar. Today's conversation will also be recorded and the recording will be housed on our DHAP OHE website at cdc.gov forward slash HIV forward slash DHAP forward slash OHE. Should you have any questions after the webinar, please email the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention's Office of Health Equity at our shared email address, which is dhpohe at cdc.gov. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Kirk B. Henney. Dr. Kirk Henney currently serves as the Acting Associate Director for the Office of Health Equity in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. Dr. N. Henney earned his bachelor's degree in sociology from James Madison University and his master's and doctoral degrees in medical sociology from Howard University. His CDC experience includes extensive work in the field of HIV prevention and care as a behavioral scientist and epidemiologist. Dr. Henney has authored over 35 papers in scientific peer-reviewed journals and other publications. His research addresses a range of HIV-related topics, including HIV behavioral interventions for African-American heterosexual men, housing, interpersonal violence, e-health interventions, and other related topics. Dr. Henney also served as guest editor for the AIDS and Behavior Special Issue HIV in the South, which was published in 2019. So without further ado, we're gonna welcome Dr. Henny to moderate today's webinar. Thank you, Bashar, and uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you to our Interfaith Approaches to End the HIV Epidemic in the US webinar, which coincides with National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day. This year, National Faith HIV Awareness Day will be observed on Sunday, August 29th. We are delighted to be joined by Rama and their founder and executive director who spearheaded the first observance of National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day in August, 2017. Khadija Abdullah will speak more about the genesis of, uh, of this particular day and her organization's work following my remarks. Now, during the duration of my career, my research has focused on HIV epidemic and disproportionate impacts on, in communities of color, which are also the communities with the highest rates of faith belief and religious service attendance. History has clearly has demonstrated the ways in which faith communities and religious institutions have tirelessly worked to eliminate just injustice across sectors in our society. The role of faith institutions in our HIV prevention and care strategies and in HIV equity broadly cannot be understated. As religion and spirituality can serve as protective factors in mitigating adverse health outcomes. Our interfaith health and health equity strategies must also contend with a weaponization of faith against people living with HIV and communities that are disproportionately impacted by the epidemic. Therefore, our discussion today will focus on best practices for meaningful interfaith collaborations to end the HIV stigma and the HIV epidemic. The panel will also discuss challenges that exist for interfaith HIV prevention efforts. 
Last but not least, our panel will also consider how public health entities should adapt their HIV prevention engagement with youth and young adults who can become disenchanted from traditional religious institutions, but who still report spirituality as essential to their lived experiences and how they navigate their health and well being. We are excited to be joined by four dynamic panelists today who are community-based health, sexual health advocates, health department staff, and interfaith leaders. Each panelist brings a unique perspective to their work. However, their commonality between each of our speakers is their commitment to eliminating HIV stigma and their desire to cultivate holistic wellness and healing to communities most impacted by, HIV, by the HIV epidemic and other health disparities. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who will give a brief two minute overview of how National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day was conceptualized and her organization's work. Next slide, please. Khadija Abdullah is the founder and executive director of Rama reaching all HIV positive Muslims in America. Khadija Abdullah is a Connecticut native and graduate of Southern Connecticut State University. Khadija founded Rama in 2012 as she recognized the need to provide HIV education in the American Muslim community. Khadija experienced several encounters with Muslims living with HIV who expressed hurt and pain they felt during the stigmatization and isolation within their own community. As Rama's president, she has overseen and built crucial programs to tackle this issue in the Muslim community and other faith communities. Khadija continues to look for innovative and powerful ways to make a greater impact and eliminate stigma, including evolving Rama to focus on HIV in all faith communities. We now welcome Khadija Abdullah to speak about her work and the National Faith HIV Awareness Day. Khadija? Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. I am so honored to be in this space with all these amazing people and a CDC event. Wow, <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you for having me here. Um, so yes, I started Rahma in 2012. Rahma means mercy in Arabic, and the goal was to address HIV stigma in the Muslim community. But as we know, HIV stigma is rampant in all faith communities. So in 2017, uh, myself and some of the other people like Dr. Lucas Burley, Elder George Kerr, Reverend Mike Schunemeyer, Dave Barris, Dr. Pulliam, and Reverend Kerry Goodman, and Pastor Will Francis, we founded uh, Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day with the goal to address stigma in all faith communities. Um, and our goal was to make it an official awareness day and really try, at least, I mean, we should do this every day, but at least one day out of the year, we can come together and address uh, the stigma. Um, so in year one, we um, convened in DC. We had a high level reception at the human rights campaign based in DC. Uh, the next day we did a walk and rally from uh, the White House to Freedom Plaza. And we had people from all faiths. It was for, to me, it was beautiful. Um, we had different prayers, we had dances, we had music, we had people talking, people who were sharing their stories. And uh, we were able to reach over 100,000 people in its first year. Um, so, you know, it really warmed our hearts to people across the nation, you know, celebrating this day and um, being aware of it. And then last year, we officially recognized as an official awareness day by HIV.gov, which is a huge milestone. Uh, especially during COVID. <laughs> um, and this year, doing a big virtual event, please join us on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern at facebook.com slash faith aids day. Uh, we're going to focus on HIV in the South in the faith community. We have about nine people who are part of this documentary um, film, sharing their stories, things they face in their faith community, and how the leaders can take a stand and make a difference. Additionally, there's a, a Faith Leader Toolkit. So it's your first time doing anything around this Awareness Day. Our grantor, Wake Forest Compass University, part of a Gilead Compass Initiative, they created a toolkit for faith leaders to kind of utilize. It has, uh, it has religious texts, it has guidance, it has language, 
It has how to involve people in HIV and your services. So definitely utilize the toolkit if you want to do your own awareness day. And hopefully I can share the link somewhere um, here in the chat. But, you know, as part of doing Rahma, of course, I face barriers. HIV is very stigmatized. I started it because I met a Muslim man living with AIDS, and he told me he didn't feel welcome. And it really, you know, bothered me because we didn't talk about sexual health at all in our faith community. So forget HIV or AIDS. So I'm glad to see how far from Rahma has come. Um, hopefully we can do more work together as a community of all faiths so we can eradicate stigma in our faith communities. And I think that's two minutes, so I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> but that's a brief overview of Rahma. Learn more at haverahma.org and hopefully I'll share the, the links um, in the chat. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Khadija, for that great intro and overview of, uh, of National HIV, um, National HIV Faith Awareness Day, as well as your organization. And so we would also like to introduce the rest of our esteemed panelists for today's webinar. Next slide. So first we have Carol Terrell, a Faith Communities Project Coordinator at the Division of HIV, SCD, HCV Prevention in New York State. Department of Health. Um, Carolyn Terrell is a public health administrator um, at, the, at the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute. She is responsible for coordinating the Institute's statewide efforts to increase the involvement of faith communities in HIV prevention and care activities to enhance collaborations between faith communities and HIV service providers. Ms. Terrell is a certified health education specialist, was graduated from uh, Syracuse University and has over 20 years of experience in public health. She is a member of various national and international professional health, uh, professional public health and wellness association and has presented her work at international and national health conferences since 2004. Ms. Terrell is the co-author of the journal article early results of a statewide initiative to involve faith communities in HIV prevention. She is actively involved in interfaith activities and is committed to fostering understanding of religious and spiritual traditions and practices and the intersection of faith and health. And, for, and just as a disclaimer, uh, due to her connection, uh, Carol, Carol Terrell will be off camera uh, for the duration um, of our presentation but she is definitely on board and ready to be part of this dynamic panel. Next slide, please. We also have uh, Ms. Angelica Lindsay Ali, Program Director and Vice President of Outreach Services for Ebony House Incorporated. Angelica Lindsay Ali, AKA the Village Auntie, is a certified sexual health educator public health professional, and a recognized authority in sexual health, intimacy, and emotional well-being. With over 20 years experience in women's wellness, Lindsay Ali draws, draws upon her clinical, cultural, and religious training to educate women about sex and intimacy from an Islamic and African lens. She leads a global following of over 50,000 women spanning 86 countries who love her practical, heart-centered advice and teachings. Over the past several years, Lindsay Ali has hosted and facilitated over 100 workshops for Muslim girls and young women on spirituality, feminine attributes, love, intimacy, relationships, traditional approaches to sexuality, feminine gender identity within the framework of traditional West and East African societies. Next slide, please. And last but definitely not least, we have Reverend Don Abram, founder of Pride in the Pews. Reverend Abram is an adept thinker, writer, and public theologian at the, in, at the intersection of race, religion, sexuality, and social change. He has earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Pomona College and a Master's Degree of Divinity from Harvard University, both on full tuition scholarships. Currently, he serves as a founder and executive director of Pride in the Pews, 
a grassroots nationwide organization promoting LGBTQIA plus equity within and outside the Black church. Through education empowerment, Pride in the Pew seeks to create more LGBT affirming uh, Black churches that embody agape love in action and in deed. So on behalf of the Office of Health Equity, we welcome all of our panelists to this webinar today. Next slide, please. And so in order to begin our, our webinar, we like to pull, we have some questions that, um, that have been developed in order to get our conversation started. Um, and then after the question, these sets of questions are read, uh, we'll ask, uh, we'll select um, our speakers to respond, uh, to provide their responses to these questions. And then at the end, we'll, as, as Bashar mentioned at the top of the uh, presentation, we'll open up to the audience for, for questions and answers uh, uh, for our panelists. So our first question appears on the screen and it reads, what are the best practices in engaging groups disproportionately impacted by HIV within faith communities? How does interfaith outreach and engagement differ with the leadership of faith communities and members of congregation? So we'll first pitch this question to Carol uh, to provide a response. Carol? Great, thank, thank you, um, Kurt. Um, first of all, thank you for, for including us in, in this um, panel discussion today. In terms of, of the response to the, the first question, in terms of best practice and engaging on um, groups disproportionately impacted um, by, by HIV within faith communities, certainly that varies um, based on, on the community itself. But for us, it's, it really the, started with the recognition of the historical role of faith communities um, in, in, in public health. I think that's that's extremely important, and to recognize that faith communities certainly have have contact and have access to to um, to communities that might not use our traditional public health um, programs to access um, information. So for us, that um, best practice begin with recognizing their role um, and also inviting them to be part of of the conversation from the beginning, from the planning stage, in terms of, of responding to a public health um, issue or emergency, certainly in this particular case, in terms of, of responding um, collectively with us to, um, to the HIV pandemic. So recognizing their role, um, inviting them to the table, but also um, inviting them to the table, but also going to them and listening to them and responding to to their questions and their needs and and everything else that 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 they need from us in order to to feel as if they are fully um, engaged in the planning and in the process and in the outcome itself. Um, and then thirdly, in terms of the the um, the best practices, also to go to where they are and not necessarily expect them to come to the health department in our particular case. So we go to their community, we go to their meetings, we meet with them where they are, rather than having them come to us. They're, we're always inviting them to come to the health department, but for us in terms of really, um, it was important for us since we need them and we're reaching out to them, it was important for us to go to where they actually exist. And then certainly the last in terms of, of um, to understand their existing practices. So part of getting to, to know um, the, the, the faith communities, getting to know the, um, the faith leaders within those faith communities, it's important for us to know their exist, what they're currently doing. Because as we talk about historically, faith, com faith communities have played a significant role in our public health efforts. They have been there, as you mentioned before, in terms of responding to social, to social health, to social conditions, but they've also been there to, to respond to some of the social determinants of, of, of health that we know um, have a significant impact in terms of, the, um, of individuals' access to, to, um, to health care, but also access to services. And, and these social determinants of health 
also have an impact on, on health outcomes. So certainly, like I said, recognizing them, not simply lip service, but recognizing that faith institutions play a significant role and can work with us, with, with, um, can work in true partnership with health departments to respond to our public health emergencies and our public health issues. I'm um, listening to them and responding to their needs. And I'll give you examples you know, later on and go into where they are so that we get to know um, their community. And then lastly, to really find out what they, how they traditionally respond to, um, to health issues within their communities. Because most of them have, have um, health ministries and, and other services. So it's important for us to understand what their current practices are, the communities that they serve, and to look at ways in which we can work together to, to enhance that. Great, thank you, Carol, for, for that response. Angelica, same question for you. So I'll start with the second question first. Uh, I think we need to change our approach in terms of engaging communities of faith. We often start from the top down, and we really need to start in the musalla, in the, in the pews. We need to start with the people. A lot of people are under the impression that a religious leader is like a president. They get voted in, and they have this autonomous power. And that's not really how it works in authentic and very generative faith communities. The, the congregation, those are the people who are guiding the leadership. They select leadership that fits what they need in the community at, at that time. So what often happens with partnerships and collaborations, we go to the reverend, we go to the imam, we go to the babalao, we go to you know the rabbi, instead of going to the people who sit in the pews. And I think the best practice that we have to shift in terms of interfaith engagement is to engage the women, the church mothers, the aunties in the masjid, the women who bring the food to the bimbe. We have to engage the women. Even though they are not titled faith leaders, they are the ones who are the pillars of the communities and the stewards of faith. They're the ones who are the Sunday school teachers. They're running the Islamic weekend school. They are the people that people who are living with HIV, may, that may be the only person in the community who knows uh, that there are people who are living with HIV who are praying next to them, who are worshiping there. We have to stop marginalizing women um, because of, you know, misogyny, because of, you know, culture traditions that say that, you know, women are just ushers and we just serve the food. No, we also are culture bearers. We also shift trends in the community. The preacher goes home and he might go to his wife. He might go to his mother. He might go to his auntie. Those are the women who can cause change and sometimes radical transformation within congregations. So instead of just going to male titled leaders within faith communities, we have to stop marginalizing the women and we have to engage them on a more um, expansive approach so that we can get these things taken care of in a way that is swift and engaging. Thank you, Angelica. And Don, same question to you. Best practice for engaging uh, disproportionately impacted for groups disproportionately impacted by HIV within faith communities and the other questions as well. Don? So first, I'd like to thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this conversation and a huge thank you to uh, my co-panelists. Uh, and I would say amen to all that had been shared thus far. And I'd also like to add that one best practice that I think is absolutely critical to this work uh, is storytelling. Uh, centering the voices and lived experiences of those most impacted is key. I think often uh, we center those who are at the nexus of power uh, with these institutions to Angelica's point. Um, and we do that to the detriment of centering and lifting up narratives that actually house the very solutions that we need uh, to solve these collective issues. Um, often, I think we are quick uh, to lift up stats and figures, uh, but we don't center the human experience um, and what I have found in my work thus far is that it's the story that moves people. That has always been the case within my own religious tradition, uh, and that is deeply rooted uh, within both African uh, and Black cultural context. It is the oral tradition that moves folks. And in my religious tradition, there's a scripture that says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Uh, so it lets me know that it's not just our faith uh, that will bring us to a place where we're able to meet this critical need, but it's also lifting up our testimonies, lifting up 
the experiences and stories of those most impacted. So when we are engaging in this work, we have to be sure to center those who are most impacted, their stories, their voices, their experiences, and allow that to lead our strategy, our outreach, allow that to lead the materials that we put out, allow that to lead the language that we use, allow that to lead the scriptures that we lift up, the frameworks that we adopt, and the pedagogical approaches, right, that we implement in this work. Uh, so I amen to all that was said, but also that centering of storytelling, I think is absolutely key because it can be left out uh, in service of things that we would see as being more important. Great, thank you, Don. Thank you, panelists, for, for your responses to, to question one. Next slide, please. And ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna ask that um, our panel, uh, first of all, I may, not, I may uh, limit the responses to the two of our panelists as we go through the questions. And also we'll ask the panelists if they can limit their responses to uh, approximately two minutes or so, uh, just so that we can get through all the questions and leave time for Q&A um, at the end. So. With that being said, our next question um, is, how do you establish and maintain partnerships with faith-based organizations and faith communities? So for this question, I'm gonna go back to Carol uh, to provide a, a response. And then after that, we'll go to Angelica and then we'll move on to the next question, uh, starting with uh, Don afterwards. So Carol, your response? So the, our, the Faith Communities Project at the Health Department was, de was developed out of um, di in, re in direct response to individuals living with HIV who requested that we include faith communities in our HIV prevention um, efforts. And as a result of that, and certainly recommendations from commissioned reports that said, you know, you need to include faith communities, especially in strategies to reach communities of, of, of African and Latinx um, because of the significant role of faith. So we certainly took that into consideration in, the de in developing um, the, the, the Faith Communities Project, certainly to enhance our HIV, um, advance our HIV prevention and healthcare efforts um, throughout New York State. And we did that by establishing what we call regional committees. Some people might call them coalitions, but these were comprised of representatives from within faith communities, similar to what um, Sister Ali referenced, and um, there were representatives of, of staff from community-based organizations and also individuals living with HIV. So we have worked over the years with these regional committees across New York State to do two, three things. Number one, to increase awareness within faith communities, um, because that was a request that they made, that they really wanted ongoing ongoing. Um, educational in, uh, education pertaining to HIV. Secondly, we work with them in planning programs that to, in addition to increasing awareness, to mitigate the stigma that continues to be one of our um, major, major issue in, in, in addressing um, HIV, as Khadija mentioned earlier. And thirdly, to connect our community-based organizations with um, our faith communities. Uh, because many of them are in the same, the same, you know, um, um, block, and they don't know that they exist. So part of that for us was to establish this this relationship in order to maintain it, to find ways in which they can collaborate together. Yeah, thank you. There you go. <laughs> and and then so that's how we have we have established and we have maintained these relationships with our um, faith-based organizations. In addition to that, when I mentioned earlier about really listening to what the community um, said that they needed, one of the things that our faith leaders said to us when we traveled throughout the state to really assess what their needs were and how together community-based organizations, persons living with HIV and faith communities can work together with us, certainly, to, to advance our HIV prevention efforts, is that faith leaders said, to, to us, we do not, we did not, we do not learn about this stuff, you know, in in um, you know, in in divinity school, or seminary school, or anything, or any of the other schools that many have attended. Um, so they wanted to know how do we, how do we, how do we get this information into our um, divinity schools. So what we did in in was to really connect, and I think the next slide, you know, has that is that we connected with 
with seminaries and medical schools in New York State, um, and we also um, worked with the, the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding, Mount Sinai um, Medical um, School, in addition to to the um, Rochester um, um, Colgate Divinity School, New York Theological Seminary, and um, Union Theological Seminary, and certainly St. Bernard, as we came together and really explored the intersection of faith and health, and to look at how divinity schools can integrate health issues into their programs so that the response to another pandemic, as we have right now with COVID, would be very different than the response of some faith communities to HIV. Great. Thank you so much for, 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 for that response and also providing those additional slides there to, to, for, for context. Um, we'll go on and move on to question three. So question three, how do we address challenges that faith-based organizations experience with public health entities? And for this one, we'll go, we'll, we'll start off with Angelica uh, to provide us a response uh, to this question. Angelica? So one of the challenge that challenges that faith-based organizations have to deal with when it comes to public health entities is a massive mistrust of both the government and public health systems that work in tandem with the medical system in this country. We cannot deny that medical apartheid is a huge issue. And so when you come to a community and you wanna talk about a health issue, whether that's HIV, cancer, diabetes, people are very reticent to engage, especially in communities of color. So you have to be very transparent up front because the challenge is, I don't really wanna hear what you're talking about if you don't have a Bible in your hand or a Quran in your hand or some cowrie shells or some beads. You have to be very transparent about what the expected deliverables and outcomes are from the very beginning because trust and authenticity is what strong partnerships rest on. So that's a big challenge. And the, the challenge is exacerbated by the fact that a lot of times there's this top-down approach. You go to the pastor first, you go to the imam first. They are not necessarily the people who are going to be consuming this prevention information or these services. You have to include people who are not only stakeholders, but are also going to be consuming these campaigns. How is it coming across to them? What are the things that they need to see? When I enter into the masjid, I know that I'm not the best person at all times to deliver an inf the, you know, the information. It may be someone who's a non-Muslim because I understand and within my community, they may say, well, if you're someone that I need to pray next to, I don't need you to know all of these intimate details of my, my health history. So also understanding the nuances of dealing with different communities and the cultures that are indicative within those communities is extremely important. The Black Muslim community in Detroit is very different from the Bengali Muslim community in Levine, Arizona. So knowing how to address both of those, uh, you know, cultural nuance, uh, the distrust of, of public health in general, and the lack of wanting to engage with anything that is not expressly faith-based, these are challenges that exist. Great, thank you so much, Angelica, for your response. Uh, let's move on to question four. Question four. How do you think our collective work can better address the intersection of faith and religion and public health, particularly in the context of disparities and equity in HIV? And for this, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Don for, for a response. Reverend Abram? Yes, thanks so much for this. I think as we consider, especially as I think about the Black church in particular, as we consider the intersections of faith and religion and public health, we cannot have this conversation without acknowledging the fact that there have been decades of queer phobic, homophobic, and transphobic theologies um, that have informed the way in which we talk about public health issues and crises. Um, and if we don't acknowledge the fact that those ideologies and theologies at, are at work in our conversations, we will not be able to accurately, uh, accurately address the barriers to us having them. All right, so that means that as we walk into these communities, we have to be cognizant of the theological foundation that these communities rest on. Uh, but here's a really critical point and note that I think we should all acknowledge, and that is the goal should not be to convert or to convince or challenge, right? The goal should be to meet them where they are. 
All right, so it's not a matter of us coming up with an exhaustive, robust program in which we're hoping to launch with their support and uh, name attached to it, but we should say we have this desire and here's what we think, we are thinking, but we recognize that you understand what is best for your community. So we want to know what parts of this is most helpful for you uh, and who is best poised, right, to engage in this conversation in your community. Uh, so part of it is recognizing that we may not, to Angelica's point once again, we may not be the best folks to have that conversation. Uh, so maybe it's a matter of being in conversation with those who are in the pews and in the pulpit, in my context, um, while also saying, we want to meet you where you are, provide you the most salient resources and ensure that those resources are context and culturally specific. Uh, and then the other piece that I think is important to this, especially as we think about reaching those who are disproportionately impacted by HIV, uh, we have to acknowledge that they need to be in that conversation too. <laughs> Right, so it's not just the leaders of those institutions, it's not just those that aren't affected by this, but going back to my point around storytelling, we have to ensure that our approaches are rooted in the lived experiences and that there is someone directly impacted and affected at, affected at the table when we have these conversations. Great, thank you for, thank you, Dawn, for your response there. Let's go on to question five. And for this question, we're gonna have all of our panelists uh, respond to this question. Question five, what do you consider success as it relates to interfaith collaboration? How do you define and measure success in reducing faith-based HIV and sexual health stigma in the communities where you work? So we'll start with Carol, go, looping back to Carol, uh, uh, your, your thoughts on, this, on, this, on these questions. Thank you. Um, in terms of how do we define and measure measure success, um, in terms of for us, in, as it pertains to certainly um, stigma and sexual health, is is our ability to have those conversations within um, communities of faith. Um, the way our programs are designed, when we when we um, develop uh, and work with the the regional committees to develop um, a particular program, depending upon what the, the, su the subject matter is. We always bring in, hopefully, a local um, content expert, quote unquote, and then we bring in, um, as Don indicated, individuals to provide um, their lived experience, to tell the story, their story and their experience, to, to really um, help the, the, the faith community understand how they have been impacted you know, by by um, HIV and, and how their experience within their, their um, faith communities has either helped them or, or has um, you know, challenged um, you know, their, their, their health and, and well-being. So for us to be able to, the number of congregations that we're able to bring these conversations to, um, to bring in individuals living with HIV, individuals, um, and also to bring in community-based organizations and others who can come together at the table so we can have this open and honest conversation is how we continue really to measure success. Because our goal certainly is to, part of it is to increase awareness, um, to look at ways in which we can mitigate that conversation. And what we hear constantly is that it's important for us to have these ongoing conversations. For some of us, it's like, well, we've been doing this for a long time, but people keep saying we need to continually have these conversations. So that's one of the ways in which we can measure success. We also, you know, evaluate every program to get feedback um, from the participants. Great. Great. Thanks, Carol. Um, Angelica? So I'm going to read the answer <laughs> that I sent in from my talking points just because I like it and I want to make sure that I'm brief. And I also want to, to just reiterate the fact that although I work for Ebony House as a behavioral health services organization, I've been given the, the freedom and the time to work on a grassroots level with women. So all of my work around sexual health for the last 
five or six years has been centered squarely on women alone. So I'm just going to share my story. Uh, my success stories lies in a women's ability to establish agency over their lives in tangible ways. So not, you know, trying to move mountains from an organizational standpoint or from a congregational standpoint, but making impact in individual women's lives, whether that's developing an understanding of holistic anatomy, gaining the resilience and strength to engage in prevention, education and testing, or developing the self-efficacy to engage in behavioral health services around disclosure and medication, medication adherence. I measure success by a woman's ability to access the services that best suit her most immediate need. I define and measure success in reducing stigma in faith-based communities by their willingness to engage in high-level and community-based discussions with stakeholders and the inclusion of education and services as a regular part of worship and community building efforts. So that's how, that's how I would um, define success. Uh, anytime a woman can come to me and say that, you know, I took the test or, you know, I, I started taking my medication again, or I, you know, I'm, I'm entering the dating pool again. That's something that we often don't talk about interpersonal relationships and how faith plays into that. Those are things that I consider success stories because it's incremental change that I think makes the most impact. Great. Thanks, Angelica, for, 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 for that thoughtful and succinct response. Um, Don, same question for you. Yes. Yeah, so for Pride in the Pews, we measure success in two ways. First and foremost, to what extent have we created liberating and healing spaces for LGBTQ plus Christians? And in what ways and to what degree have we equipped churches uh, to mitigate the impact of queer phobic, homophobic, and other toxic theologies? Um, recognizing that this work is interconnected. Um, so as we are tackling HIV stigma, we are also tackling houselessness. We are also tackling job insecurity. We are also tackling social isolation that exists within these faith communities. So we want to make sure that we're thinking about this on a macro level institutionally, but also on a micro level, recognizing that most of the transformation um, that we see in this work often comes on a micro level through conversation, through events and action that's not always measurable, right? That's not always quantifiable, but in some cases has the most impact. So those are the two ways that we measure and define success and I'll simply say here that I think for us, uh, we have been working to um, launch a project called the Can I Get a Witness Project, which is focused on collecting the stories of LGBTQ plus Christians. And our success by far, um, I believe, lies in the fact that we've been able to hold space for folks who've been ostracized in their own communities. Uh, and yes, we've connected with faith leaders and we are on CDC panels and we're doing that work. But what has been most gratifying and most successful is being able to affirm and to create healing spaces where they did not exist. Thank you. Th thank you, Don. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for your responses to question five. We'll move on to our last question for the panelists. And so I'm going to slightly augment this question a bit uh, for, in the interest of time. Um, for each one of you, I'm going to ask what one area of opportunity exists in addressing health equity in interfaith context, particularly as it relates to the HIV epidemic, mental health, and addressing the public health threat of racism. And there's lots of potential responses for this, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each of you, each of you all to share just one of those opportunities as you may see it. So we'll first start with uh, Angelica. We'll, we'll start with your response. Okay, I'm going to read again. I usually don't read, but I'm trying to keep it brief. Um, and I know me, I'll go off, especially on this question. So I utilize the power of the digital hush harbor, and I have to shout out Dr. Melva Sampson, who was the first person that I ever heard use that term, uh, to create faith communities that meet the people where they are and reduces the generational divide. Because we haven't talked about that at all. Uh, young people are not necessarily in the, in the pews, they're on pages and profiles. So the power of technology to bridge gaps and reduce spiritual abuse, as Reverend Don mentioned, is unmatched. My work lies at the intersection of the sacred and the sacral, and I can illustrate illustrate that in real time through social media and other digital platforms that give both a visual and oral message of community that makes for a more responsive approach to mitigating health disparities. So technology is my opportunity uh, to address health equity. Oh, great. Thank you, Angelica. 
Don, you're one area of opportunity that, as you see, that exists uh, in addressing health equity and interfaith context. Yes, happy, happy to provide this. So one, first and foremost, it is technology. Uh, that's how we've created community. That's how we've connected with folks in the midst of this pandemic, and we'll continue to do that. But I think the other piece is less about um, the medium or modality that we use to engage congregations. I think it's the framework that we're using, right? We are in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, and institutions, particularly Black, LGBTQ plus serving organizations um, are, I think, really poised to hear the ways in which addressing HIV and other health disparities can actually aid us in more effectively pushing back against the next pandemic, right, against the next crisis. So tying this into um, other issues that are hot button issues, social justice issues, disparity issues, racism, recognizing and making the connection for congregations and faith leaders, describing the ways in which this crisis is in fact um, amplified by the disparities that exist, which are caused by racism and misogyny and homophobia will enable them to to access this conversation in a way that we could not have before because we have never experienced a pandemic. So I think really leveraging this moment to say, if you care about protecting your community, then it also means that we must address underlying conditions that make us susceptible right, to this crisis. And that includes things like HIV. Thank you, Don, for, 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 for your response. And we'll have Carol. Carol, if you can close us out, please, uh, what from your perspective is the one area of opportunity that exists in addressing health equity in an interfaith context, particularly as it relates to the epidemic of mental health and addressing the public health threat of racism. So for, for me, it's, it's collaboration. What I, the opportunity for our, let's say, um, health institutions, hospitals to connect and to work directly with faith communities, I think is, is extremely important when we talk about addressing health equity. For example, there are some groups that we've worked with, and I know in, in we've, we've, um, we've worked with a group in, um, I think, Bethel AME Church in, in Delaware is like an example. They have a program where the hospital in Delaware actually works with, goes into the church, um, has a, um, I don't know if it's once a week that they're at the church, but they take their service to the hospital. So um, the folks in that community who might not trust that hospital, might not be comfortable going to the hospital, they know that that, that faith community, that church in particular, is, is in the center of their community, so the hospital will come to them. So I think that, to me, is one way in which we can really bridge and, 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 and um, address health equity. Same thing I mentioned before in terms of Mount Sinai. They have a spiritual care program where they actually reach out to the, to the faith leaders um, within, within, in, I think, in East Harlem, where they are, and they bring them to the, to, the, to the hospital, like maybe monthly, to talk about some of the health issues, you know, impacting the community, and also to find out the needs that they have. That type of, of collaboration between, in terms of um, health hospitals or health institutions uh, um, with faith communities is a way I see in terms of really bridging, bridging the gap and certainly addressing um, health equity in an interface um, context. Great. Thank you, Carol. And thank you all um, to our panelists for that lively and engaging discussion. Uh, so now we're going to go on, we're going to move on to our question and answer portion of our program. And we know that many of you who, who many of you have been participating in this conversation on the chat, and we want to also thank you for your engagement. So with less than 10 minutes to go, we'll probably only have time to get to a few, to just a, a couple of these questions. Um, and so we're, I'm gonna ask my colleagues, uh, Bashir and Lamont to uh, please go ahead and read the first question you have in your, in your uh, question and answer queue. And then we'll begin the conversation. Again, we'll have time for maybe about uh, just a couple, uh, a couple of questions before closing out at the top of the hour. So uh, Bashir or Lamont, can you please read the question from the Q&A box? Great, so our first question is, with the issue of stigma, do you see Muslims being willing to openly talk about being HIV positive? It is really hard to keep our clients who are Muslim due to them not disclosing to anyone. Okay, so for this question, thank you for that thoughtful question, Lamont. So for this one, we're gonna bring back Khadija 
um, who uh, was who, who began with her presentation at the top of the hour. So Khadija, uh, could you respond to the question just read by Lamont, please? Yes, I it is it's hard. Um, and sure, Angelica can say it to it as well. Her and I have worked together in the past and she's amazing and absolutely love her. Um, we actually did a video recently, I mentioned that we're doing for Faith AIDS Day and we had some Muslim um, participants, but they didn't want their face shown, they had their voice changed and their name changed because of the stigma around HIV in our community. Um, we also have done retreats for Muslims who are positive and they asked lots of questions or they didn't want to come because they were afraid they'll be outed. We actually had another Muslim who confided in someone and then someone disclosed their status to everyone in the mosque and they never came back again. So there are, these are some real fears and we have found that it's hard because it's just, unfortunately it's a stigma and it's the judgment, but we're hopefully, we're trying to normalize the conversation around HIV and AIDS and hopefully having more faith leaders and community leaders and health ministries and even like Jelica said, women. We actually work with, the, work with women here in DC. They did a conference for older people, most of them are women, they're leading organizing and you know, getting the flyers out. And um, at one mash, this is like for me, this is phenomenal. At one mash, we were there, the Imam invited us to come out and speak about Rahma. And one of the people that came up, he was a man living with HIV and he disclosed his status. Everyone just stopped, they didn't believe it was something that was real. So I think normalizing the conversation would make it maybe more safer from some of the HIV to feel more safe in their communities, but we do have some work to do. Okay, great. Thanks for, thanks for that response, Khadija. Um, Lamont, let's go on to the next question uh, that you have in your queue. So the next question is, uh, would the panelists be able to be connected with the regional committees? Okay, so for that, um, that might be a general question. So let's, um, I'm going to start with uh, 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 Carol on this question. Carol, do you mind fielding that question? I, I'm not certain I understand what the question is. Can you repeat the question? Sure. sure. Uh, the question is, would the panelists be able to be connected, I think, with the regional committees um, that um, you were speaking about in one of your earlier responses? Right, right. Oh, can the panelists be connected to the regional committees? That's why I'm a little con oh, confused. My, my apologies, the registrants, the participants, rather. Uh, oh. Um, if, if you're in New York, if you're in New York State and you're, and you're interested in certainly being part of our regional committees, you can certainly send me uh, an email and I'll be more than happy to, to connect you to those regional committees. Right. And, 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 if, for, and if there's additional information that's needed, uh, we ask that the uh, uh, person who's, um, who asked that question, he could just email us and then we'll go ahead and uh, if we need to make further connections, we can go ahead and, and, and assist with that as well. Um, and given the time, I think we have time for perhaps one last question. So Bashir and Lamont, if you can ask the, the last question from our Q&A queue. That's actually our last question for today. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Well, listen, um, we are actually at 155. So first of all, I want to thank you so much for everyone tuning in to today's webinar. Um, uh, of course, we wanna thank our, our dynamic panelists for their transformative healing work in the community-based organizations, the health departments and in the faith community. We hope that this webinar uh, inspires the public health infrastructure to center healing and transformation in our collective work to end the epidemic and to address health disparities across the board. Um, uh, uh, again, thank you all so much for your thoughtful, uh, for your responses to the questions that were posed uh, as part of the webinar and also for the thoughtful questions uh, that were shared in the Q&A, um, uh, in the Q&A chat box. Please keep in mind that this webinar was recorded and will be found at the following link, the NPEN and link and the DHAP uh, OHE link. Um, I believe that was shared uh, earlier. Um, actually, if it's go on to the next next slide, please. On the next slide, you will see the links um, of, of those two um, uh, where the uh, recordings will be housed um, once we move the slide to the next page. Um, and again, if you have any questions after the webinar, please email 
our to our shared health equity email address as dhap dhpohe at cdc.gov. Again, thank you all to Carol, to Angelica, to Don and Khadija uh, for being part of this great panel. Thank you all for attending. Um, we're going to wish you all the the, uh, the very best, happy and safe weekend um, until we meet again. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day and great weekend.